the previous video, I explained how and why Super Mario Bros. started the iconic Italian plumber's career. While old by modern standards, I still think the original Super Mario Bros. is a game worth experiencing, and with its successful first installment comes the inevitable sequel. Only a year later, Super Mario Bros. 2 would release on the Famicom to Japanese audiences. However, this version would never be released internationally and became known as the Lost Levels. The version we got in the West was a copy of another game exclusive to Japan as well. So how did this happen, and what makes Super Mario Bros. 2 USA unorthodox to its Japanese counterpart? Now just to clarify, Last Levels will get its own video, and the reason I chose to do this version first is because I'm an American, and this is the version that was released internationally for us Westerners. Before we get started, I'll go over this right now. Like Super Mario Bros, Mario 2 did receive a plethora of remakes and re-releases. Whichever version you play is up to you, but for this video, I'll be playing the NES original because that's the version I experienced and was the first to be released. But without further ado, let's dive into Super Mario Bros 2 USA. So to begin talking about Mario 2, the first thing we have to talk about is a game called Doki Doki Panic. Doki Doki Panic released in 1987 on the Famicom and was a joint collaborative project between Nintendo and Fuji Television, a broadcasting network in the Tokyo area. They previously published All Night Nippon, and to put it simply, All Night was a retooling of Lost Levels offering different level design and updated graphics. Doki Doki Panic's premise revolved around a storybook set in the fictional world of Moo. One day, the people of Moo invented a dream machine, because in Moo, the quality of dreams determines the weather. Maybe the Moo people are really good at lucid dreaming. But things go wrong when a mischievous being named Mamu invades Moo and uses the dream machine to unleash monsters across the land. However, the people of Moo learn of Mamu's weakness to vegetables and use the power of healthy nutrition to defeat him. Eventually, the old storybook ends up in the hands of twins Pokey and Picky, and of course, being siblings, the twins get into a fight and end up ripping the last page of the story, freeing Mamu. Mamu then kidnaps the twins into the storybook, forcing their parents Mama and Papa, their brother Imajin, and his girlfriend Lena to travel into the world of Moo and save the twins. Also, the family has a pet monkey named Rusa, who is responsible for giving the twins the book, so thank him for that. Now, how does this all connect to Mario? Well, if we travel across the Pacific and back Back to North America, you'll remember in my previous video, Super Mario Bros. was a critical success in North America, selling over 40 million units. By 1988, consumers were eagerly anticipating a sequel, and Nintendo of America was enthusiastic about localizing the game for overseas audiences, one of whom was a man named Howard Phillips. Just to go over his resume, Howard Phillips was an executive for Nintendo of America, and one of his responsibilities was to play test games from Japan before they were localized. A pretty cool fucking job if you ask me. Anyway, one day, Nintendo of Japan sent over a disc containing the sequel to Super Mario Bros. Phillips, Excited to see what the Mario team cooked up, booted the game up on his Famicom disc system and began playing. According to the story, Phillips ate a poison mushroom in World 1-1, which he considered to be a dirty trick. Leaving a bad taste in his mouth, he and Nintendo of America considered Lost Levels to be too difficult for North American audiences. Going back to Doki Doki Panic, Miyamoto himself was surprisingly actively involved in the development process. Originally before Doki Doki released, the engine started as a Mario tech demo. With that in mind, it was then decided by Nintendo of Japan that Doki Doki Panic would be converted into a Mario game, which was convenient in the fact that the Doki Doki characters resembled the Mario cast. With minor changes made to better fit the Mario universe, Super Mario Bros. 2 would release in September 1988. With its origin of being a copy and paste job out of the way, Super Mario Bros. 2 hands down has to be the most unorthodox Mario game, and the first evidence of that is in the story. When Mario opened a door after climbing a long stair in his dream, another world spread before him, and he heard a faint voice call for help to be freed from a spell. After awakening, Mario went to a cave nearby, and to his surprise, he saw exactly what he saw in his dream. That's the setup for Super Mario Bros. 2. There's no saving Princess Peach this time around. Instead, Mario and his friends travel to the renamed Subcon to restore peace to the dream world. Because Mario 2 is a Doki Doki Panic reskin, a lot of what you come to expect from the Mario universe won't make their appearances here. That means characters like Bowser are nowhere to be found in the game. Instead, Mamu, who was a holdout from Doki Doki Panic, serves as the main antagonist. But now he's been renamed to Wart. Wart is fitting because he's a toad, and toads are known to have warts on them. Just make sure not to lick them. While we're on the subject of Wart, this is the only Mario game where he makes a major appearance. After that, he would only make guest appearances. I wish they would reintroduce Ward as a main villain, because while Bowser is Mario's arch nemesis, Ward would at least add more variety. Anyway, with the setup done, let's talk about the gameplay. I'll first go over what's remained the same. Like in Mario 1, the goal of every stage is to reach the end and progress to the next level. You'll control Mario and his friends as you platform over obstacles and defeat enemies. And that's about it. Everything afterwards is completely different in terms of the core gameplay mechanics. Here you'll see why Mario 2 is an unorthodox Mario game. Unlike before, you can no longer stomp on enemies to defeat them, which makes Mario's trademark move obsolete this time around. Already, we're seeing what was carried over from Doki Doki Panic. During gameplay, you'll come across plants sprouting above the ground, and by pressing the B button, you'll pick them up, and once you see an enemy, you'll have to throw it at them. To throw an object, you have to hold the direction you're facing and press the B button, while only pressing B will cause your character to drop it instead. Mario 2 doesn't restrict you on what items you can pick up, 
You can also pick up enemies, and certain levels will have pink blocks which are indestructible after hitting an enemy. By no means is the combat bad, it just isn't Mario. Not having the ability to stomp on an enemy was probably a shock to a kid in the 80s who played Mario 1. It's why other NES sequels like Zelda 2 are viewed as the black sheep of their series. That last sentence does come off as harsh, but it's why I don't often come back to this game. At the very least, I should say what I like about the gameplay. To start, the core gameplay is still very simple. Every enemy can be beaten by tossing them at a corresponding enemy, with the only exception being the Phanto enemies. The controls are still great, making platforming a non-issue, and I love the charge-up move you can perform by holding down the D-pad and pressing the jump button. A lot of enemies which were brought over from Doki Doki Panic would go on to become mainstays in the Mario universe, like the Shy Guys or Babombs. For what the Mario team had, they produced a competently made game, so at the very least, Mario 2 did leave a positive legacy for the series. Mario 2 also made sure familiar power-ups like the Mushroom and Star Man made a return. However, unlike before, you won't get them like previously. On the left side of the screen will display your health bar. At the beginning of every level, you could only take two hits of damage, but getting a mushroom will increase your health for the remainder of the stage. Mushrooms are hidden in the subspace realm, which I'll explain later. For now, I highly recommend you find the mushrooms in every stage, because some of the later stages can get pretty difficult. If you do take damage, you can defeat eight enemies and a heart will appear, and collecting it will regain a bar of health. As for how to get the Starman, across every level there will be cherries you can collect, and by gathering five, a Starman will appear, and by now you should know the drill. Now comes the part of the video where I discuss my favorite part of Mario 2, that being the cast of playable characters of Mario, Luigi, Luigi, Toad, and Peach, all of whom are available at the start. At the beginning of every stage, you're allowed to pick one of the four characters, and each character has their own distinct features that separate them from each other. Whichever one you pick is up to personal preference, however there are certain instances where one character is better suited for a level over the other. As for what makes them different, each character is divided into three stat groups of speed, jump, and strength. Mario has average stats across the board, and he's an acceptable choice if you want an all-around pick. Luigi is less fast and strong as Mario, however he compensates by having the highest jump in the game. Mario 2 would actually be the first time Luigi would get his unique characteristics, like his flutter jump in midair and ice physics when coming to a stop. Luigi, in my opinion, is the best character in the game. His higher jump paired with a charge jump allows you to reach areas the others couldn't. As for Toad, on one hand, his greatest strength is his ability to lift up objects the fastest, like in World 2 when you have to dig up blocks of sand. The trade-off, however, is he has the lowest jump and runs the slowest, making platforming in later levels more difficult, because you'll have to rely on his charge jump more often than I'd like. In my playthrough, he was the character I played the least, because I didn't like the trade-offs you had to sacrifice. Princess Peach, on the other hand, is completely different. For starters, she's not the damsel in distress this time around, so that's good for her. And like Luigi, her unique moveset would go on to be reused in future Mario titles, that being her floating ability. By pressing the jump button while in midair, Peach is able to float for a brief period of time, and she isn't restricted while doing so, meaning she can still carry objects. But Peach still has her disadvantages. Her biggest is that she takes the longest to pick up items, which can leave her exposed to enemies, especially in boss fights. In the original NES version, after picking the character you want, you're not allowed to switch to another character until you clear the stage. This is later corrected in subsequent re-releases, where after you lose a life, you can swap to another character if your current choice doesn't fit the scenario you're in. Now, the nuanced and responsible argument to make is that all the characters are great at what they do, whichever one you pick is perfectly valid. However, in reality, I think Peach and Luigi are the best characters in the game. Both of them have more versatility when it comes to their unique abilities because it allows them to compensate for skills Mario and Toad don't have. Mario may be an all-rounder, but the argument only makes Luigi appear to be a better choice. Ironic given the most unorthodox Mario game has Luigi take the spotlight over his brother. As for Peach, her gliding lets her make platforming a non-issue for a brief period of time. Having the ability to be more precise when jumping makes her slow pick up a worthy trade-off. I think Mario 2's greatest accomplishment was the introduction of multiple playable characters. Although I'll admit, not all the levels are well balanced for all four characters. The fact that later Mario games starting with 3D World would allow you to play as the other members of the Mario cast was a great callback to Mario 2 USA, and going forward, I hope it's here to stay. As for the subspace areas I mentioned before, underneath certain plants will contain red potions, and tossing it will spawn a red door which will teleport you to subspace where you'll have a short period of time to collect mushrooms or coins. Always be mindful of where you place the door because items only appear on certain screens. However, if you mess up, you can just reset the screen and grab the potion to try again. Getting items is not overly complicated. The only one that comes to mind is in World 6, where you have to take the potion across a waterfall and enter the door atop a rock, so the mushroom won't be blocked in subspace. Now, you can still pull plants like previously, but the plants will release coins which are used in the slot machine minigame at the end of every level. Before you get any ideas, you can't exploit it because you can only grab coins two times in subspace. If you try after that, the plants will only release duds. Coins are used as currency at the slot machine after completing a level where you play for extra lives. If you match three of a kind, you'll get extra lives, but if it cherries in the first slot, you'll get one life. To be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the slot machine because you're leaving it all to luck. Then again, looking at modern games, I should appreciate that you can't buy coins in an in-game shop. 
Unlike Mario 1, Mario 2 uses a continue system. Lose all continues, and it's back to the start. So best of luck on the slots. Subspace is also where you can access warp zones. Entering a door in subspace at a certain point and entering a jar will warp you to another world. Always go out of your way to find the potions, because the secrets are always worth it. In Super Mario Bros, there were a total of 8 worlds to travel, with 4 stages each to complete. Mario 2 USA changes this up by now having 7 worlds to travel, each with 3 levels. Mario 2 introduces the tradition of having the worlds take on a unique aesthetic, so in the future expect to see a lot of desert and ice worlds. All the levels are borrowed from Doki Doki Panic, with minor changes to make the localized version easier. It was common in the 8-bit era for developers to make a game easier during localization, the poster child for that being Mega Man 2 with its normal or difficult mode. An explanation I found was that before streaming, when video stores were the go-to for many people, it was common that you would rent a game and return it once you were finished. In Japan, apparently renting games was illegal, so it came down to whether you were going to buy the game or not. In the West, if your main source of playing games were rentals, you'd have to spend more money on rental fees or buy the game. Because Mario Mario 2 was a reskin of Doki Doki Panic, there had to have been some uncertainty when it came to how the game would sell or be received. Now, they didn't stop fans in 1988 because like Mario 1, Mario 2 would be a commercial success, but I could only imagine the confusion people felt when playing this game for the first time. The hardest thing to talk about Mario 2's level design is that I'm unable to compare it to Mario 1. So if anything, think of this video as a dual review of Doki Doki Panic. Mario games have always varied in terms of level design and power-ups, but the core philosophy has always been there since its inception. You'll still be traveling to the right of every stage to reach the goal like every 2D platformer. One thing I love doing in 2D Mario games is speedrunning my way to the goalpost because it shows mastery over the game. Mario 2 instead is much slower in its pace because the game wants you to explore other areas or search for hidden red potions, which is a compliment I'll give the level design because going out of your way to explore will reward you with coins and mushrooms. Mario 2 doesn't offer the same challenges as in Mario 1, and I'm not saying it as a bad thing because I had a fun time during my playthrough, depending on the character I was playing as. It just proves why Luigi and Peach are the best characters to play as. There's a section in World 3-3 where you have to ascend a tower to reach a higher area. Normally, if you're playing as anyone else, you'd have to enter the door screen below and platform your way to the top. However, if you're Luigi, if you time a charge jump as the spark circles around, the knockback will make Luigi be able to reach the ladder taking a shortcut, and I'll commend Mario 2 for having that level of foresight. World 4's gimmick is it's an ice world, and anyone who's played a platformer before knows what I'm talking about. Thankfully, Peach's glide lets you negate ice physics by gliding over them, and there's another instance in World 3-2 where the glide's used as a shortcut. Going back to my previous point about this game's difficulty, even though the localizers made this game easier, there are times Mario 2 can be very challenging, especially near the end. Of course, a difficulty spike is expected when you approach the end of the game, what I'm talking about specifically is that classic NES difficulty. There might be times on your first playthrough where some levels give you a greater challenge, either by becoming longer than necessary or throwing more obstacles your way, World 5-3 being the most egregious example. It's another tower level, only this time there's no foot entrance, instead you have to use bombs to open a pathway so you can travel underground to find the door where you need to go. Then you have to traverse the tower leading to a boss exclusive to Mario 2, which can be defeated easily if you bounce into rocks off the wall. Locked doors are also common obstacles that you'll need to find keys to progress. Following a linear path will take you to the room housing the key, but also the Fanto enemy. Grabbing the key will awaken Fanto, one of the most annoying enemies in Mario 2. Fanto is invincible to damage, and your goal is to take the key to the locked door, after which he'll stop following you. You can still use the key as a weapon against other enemies, and dropping it will cause Fanto to fly off screen. A good tactic to use if you're on your last bit of HP. At the end of every stage, rather than a flagpole, you'll have to battle a mini boss against newcomer Birdo. Birdo will shoot eggs at you, and you'll have to pick them up and toss them back at Birdo three times. Birdo comes in three variants. Pink Birdo only only shoots eggs and will be the first you encounter. Red Birdo will shoot a mix of fireballs and eggs randomly, so always be ready to retaliate. And finally, Green or Gray Birdo, depending on the level, will only shoot fireballs. But the game will give you pink blocks to throw back. After defeating Birdo, we'll drop an orb, and yes, Birdo is a he, don't let the bow tie and pink skin confuse you, after which you enter a bird's mouth and get eaten. And I don't know how that works, to be honest. At the end of every world, there are traditional boss fights, but once again, they're taken from Doki Doki Panic. The only exception being the crab boss exclusive to Mario 2. All of them boil down to picking up objects and tossing them back three times, and unfortunately you have to refight certain bosses more than once, making them the weakest part of the game. Before I discuss the end game, I'll also take the time to discuss the soundtrack. Once again, Koji Kondo returns as the composer, and it should be noted that he also composed the music for Doki Doki Panic. However, for Mario 2, he actually remixed and extended a lot of the songs from Doki Doki Panic, like in the last half of the overworld theme. The only songs I can really hum at the top of my mind are the overworld and boss themes. The overworld theme is still very catchy, and the boss music loops very quickly, which is the only reason why I remember it. The only familiar track that makes a return is the Starman song, and the sound effects from Mario 1. Mario 2 isn't one of my favorite Mario soundtracks, because it's missing the charm of the previous game. With that quickly out of the way, let's now head into the end game. After clearing all 6 worlds, you'll arrive at World 7, which serves as the final world. World 7 1 will have you ascend the clouds in order to reach Wart's castle. A good tip is to bring Luigi for the first level, his high jump once again proves to be great in the section where you have to stack blocks to reach a ladder. It's also 
stage one where you'll have an encounter with the Grey Birdle, but he goes down like before. For the final stage, Wart's Castle I think is the worst final level in the Mario series. That comes off as hyperbolic, but this stage's level design is confusing when it comes to finding the mushrooms. Once you enter the castle, you can either go down or up. I chose to go down because it was the easier path to take and you could grab a mushroom along the way. If you go up and follow the path, you'll end up outside, but I never go this way because I'm paranoid. I think I'll loop back to the beginning. Eventually, you'll reach a room that requires a key to unlock a door. Going all the way to the right, you'll face a red birdo and defeating it will drop the final key. Avoiding Fanto, the final time, will lead you to the final mini boss. And after all this time, the bird statue turns on us, serving as the last mini boss. After three hits, you enter his mouth, which will take you to the final boss. Once the battle with Wart begins, he attacks you with what I'm imagining to be him burping out bubbles to cause damage. In the center of the room lies the dream machine, and throughout the battle, it'll release vegetables. Your goal is to catch them and toss them into Wart's mouth before he belches because the bubbles can destroy the vegetables. Do it six times and the fat frog goes down. Then you'll enter the next room where your character frees the people of Subcon, and the story ends with a final celebration as Wart's body is dragged away to Link's Awakening. During the celebration, it's revealed the entire game was all a dream Mario had which is a clever way of explaining why the game doesn't have the standard features of a Mario game. Once again, Mario 2 continued the trend of having a basic plot, and for a narrative based on Doki Doki Panic, the Mario team managed to complement the plot to fit a Mario game. A lot of what was introduced would be incorporated in future Mario games, so Mario 2 did have a lasting impact on the series. To give my final thoughts on Mario 2 USA, I have know I've said a lot of mixed things about this game. On one hand, I'll compliment this game for introducing the idea of multiple playable characters, while on the other hand, compare this game to Doki Doki Panic, even if we never got Doki Doki Panic in the West. And as we'll see in Lost Levels, I sympathize with this game, because Mario 2 USA had to contend with being a sequel to a critically acclaimed game, but at the same time, had to play with the cards it was given, because the other choice was far worse in my opinion. Whether it was the lesser of two evils is up to you. Mario 2 USA would eventually release in Japan as Super Mario Bros. USA, and we would get Lost Levels once Mario All-Stars released. Mario 2 USA is not a game I frequently revisit, but it'll always have the legacy of being the most unorthodox Mario game. The next time I return to the Mario franchise, it'll be the true sequel to Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. 2 Lost Levels. God help me. Thank you for watching and take care.